a massive black cat. Very long in the leg, very muscular looking, round ears. The whole body language of the thing said, this is my road, I'm not moving for you. You say, well, I've seen this big cat. Some people just flatly refuse. They think that Britain's such a sweet little island, we shouldn't have predators that size. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 26 of Big Cat Conversations. Our main guest is coming up in a couple of minutes and she is Angela from near Wellington in Somerset. Angela has a good deal of experience on the topic, mainly from several encounters when dog walking in the South Somerset countryside, including the Blackdown Hills. So we'll hear from Angela and all about her dog's reaction to big cats in a minute. After Angela, we're going to reproduce a clip from the BBC Radio 4 series, Ramblings. It's a section of an episode from 2014, when the well-known presenter Claire Balding spoke about her own sighting of a large black cat in the Wye Valley in Herefordshire, and that cropped up during the recording of that episode. Some of you may have heard it on the radio already, but it's so relevant that we thought we should feature it on the podcast here. So Claire Balding coming up later. Now, it's almost mid-June in 2020 as we schedule this episode, and again, to my knowledge, it's been reasonably busy with big cat reports around Britain in recent days. We've had a couple more here in different parts of Gloucestershire, including from a hot spot amongst the farms, fisheries and lakes at the Cotswold Water Park. We have a good network of contacts there, and they are keeping alert. I've also been in touch with people sending photos of recent and freshly filleted sheep carcasses, suspected to be from big cat impacts, and those are from places in Wales, Scotland and England. So that's disappointing, and it's a reminder that big cats may be causing hassles for some people, unfortunately. And it's a crucial part of the topic that we need to keep an eye on, so we've got another episode on impacts on sheep from big cats coming up in a couple of months' time. If you're listening to these episodes directly from the Big Cat Conversations website, which I know happens, that's fine, of course, but there are alternatives which might be more practical for people sometimes. So you can use your smart speaker if you use one of those Alexa-type devices, or there are streaming services like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and several others. If you want a free and simple service for playing podcasts on your smartphone, popular ones are Podcast Addict and the Google Podcasts app. Through any of those ways, you can subscribe to Big Cat Conversations for free and get alerts for new episodes. Okay, without further ado, here's our first guest, Angela. And just to note that in a few places during the recording, we've had to edit a bit more than we'd have wanted to because of internet glitches. But I think Angela's points are well made and clear. Angela, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I will thank you. Now, Angela, you've had various encounters in the past few years, and we're going to hear about several of them. But can we start with the very first time you feel you must have come across something like a black leopard? Right. This is, as far as I can recall, it would be something like 1990. Quite a long time ago, I've been encountering these big cats. What happened was that I decided I'd better take a couple of new pups I'd bred for a, a walk. So we went up to Witch Lodge Forestry Commission Woodland, south of Taunton, and we walked probably about half a mile through the track and then further on till we get to the end of the track and we turned around to come back. And there on the track that had been behind us was a big black animal. I was trying to work it out. I've got these two young pups with me. And it was the big German shepherd police dogs that we did see up there. And I thought initially, oh, maybe it's a new police dog, a solid black. And I kept looking at it and I thought, it doesn't look like a German shepherd. And there's no handler with it to put it on the lead because I wasn't very happy about walking past it. And it's sideways. So I got a beautiful show stand at someone who's judged gun dogs at dog shows, uh, kennel club ones, I hasten to add analyzing its conformation, this smaller head than you'd get on a dog and a flat foreface, little pricky ears, shorter neck, big withers, 
wonderful slightly sloping top line, very powerful hindquarters, thick, shiny black pelt, deep chest and long tail. And it was going flick, flick, flick at the end. And it was just watching us. I really was trying to work out what it was because I was not clearly expecting a big cat. And uh, I kept thinking, I wish the owner would put it on the lead where I don't want to try and walk past. And we just looked at each other for a minute or two. It just looked and looked and clearly been following us. And then it got bored and meandered undergrowth where the inflow stream is for the lake. And so we walked on and I let all the dogs off the lead. Fortunately, it wasn't there. They didn't find it. The following day, going into Taunton and parked my car up and somebody else drove up and parked. It turned out to be a shooting man and he was on the same beating line as I had been in the winter. And I said to him, this is a strange animal. And it turned out that at the same time, only about, I suppose, a couple of miles as the big cat walked, so to speak, from where I'd seen this cat, he had been fishing and another leopard, a big black one, had come and had a drink near him. So he knew immediately what it was because it was much nearer. He and the owner of the estate got the plea from Ilminster and they managed to take plaster casts of its footprint. So that's how... It just happened to be that suddenly two black leopards and he got the male and I got the female. In the summer, I drove up for a walk at uh, Orchard Portman, saw a tractor coming along the lane with a muck spreader behind it. And I thought, well, I'll wait because I don't want it to be spreading manure when we're walking through the field because the dogs will roll in it. And down the track to the lane, there's a gateway and there was a sort of black blob behind it went past to my surprise what could have been a leopard or just a black bit of silage sucking got up and they loped in a great big loping gallop across the field because they were disturbed by the tractor and the female was just a bit bigger than a big German shepherd so we're looking very big cats and they did have a cub well I don't know how many they had but the police dog handlers said they used to watch the mother playing with a cub on Taunton polo field Okay, and you've had many encounters since. Can we talk about the time when you feel you were stalked? I know you feel you've been followed and had one nearby several times, but can we just isolate the the key time when you felt it was full-on stalking you, Angela? Going back to the Orchard Portman female, she knew we were getting up to the woods about 8 o'clock in the morning, and she'd kind of make a cough, sort of like a cough and a grunt to tell us she was there and she'd regularly stalk us and my American dog he was getting on a bit there he'd just keep looking behind so we knew that there were other times where she played little tricks once I was up the top of the hill behind there I had 10 German short hairs so I took six hours at a time on the first walk and the cat I thought she was playing little games and she just shot the middle of six German short hair pointers diagonally and two of my males they chased it off and it never did it again. And I was talking to a former zookeeper, big cat, and he said, oh, no, she wasn't playing a game. She was trying to catch one of the dogs. <laughs> so there we are. But more recent uh, stalking, that's back in the 1990s, up um, in a different part of the Black Downs, where we were walking with said, Rowan and Pavla, my, they're now dead black ones. And I forget quite how we knew that there was a cat there. Pavla was good on noises. When I hear a noise that doesn't sound very pleased about us, I just turn around quietly and go back. So we were walking back along the escarpment, and Rowan, my black dog, was indicating by looking behind that we were being escorted out of the wood by what turned out to be a big black leopard for his home turf. And I was really surprised that we got back to my car across the field, and the cat kind of signed off to us going and what really shocked me was how close behind this big cat was probably 40 50 feet it had been stalking us all this time and I'd never seen it we heard the odd twig crack Rowan knew it was there well we all knew it was there and it clearly thought well there's that stupid woman's car just saying to me right goodbye make sure you get in your car you know or else seeing you off the property absolutely off its territory. I have no doubt that's what it was doing. That's the one that's probably in the photo I took. It's very big and we've had quite a few encounters with that big cat. It 
maybe 25, 30 feet of me. We were down at the far end of that wood and the dogs were hunting a few pheasants off the um, lap and shoot that had gone down there in what had been an area of coppiced hazels, just kind of neglected now. And I saw this big black animal further ahead from me and it was in January or December. I thought, oh my goodness, what on earth breed of huge great dog is that? And I don't know that dog because you don't tend to think big cat every time you see something black. I think maybe I should change my mind. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I wonder what on earth it's like and what it's going to do to my dogs. And then it wanted to get out of the wood and it didn't know I was just standing still with my back towards the field. Then it started galloping and I thought, oh, what now? And then I realized when it got much closer that it wasn't a dog at all. It was this big black leopard. And I just stood still, pretending I am a hazel tree. And it looked at me and it sort of said, oh, you can't fool me, you're not a hazel tree. But then bolted out into the field and was gone. So it was very close. And it's very, very big. It would be the size of something like a Japanese toaster. How did you find your two main dogs, Rowan and Pavla? How did they tend to react? How would you know when they were sensing a big cat, even if you sometimes weren't? Were there key signs you'd look for? Yeah, Pavla the bitch, the black and white bitch, she was very good on sounds for the big cats. Well, Rowan had had a few real scares, including with that one. He would tell us when we were being stalked, went ahead a bit because he's male and he ranged a bit more. And he knew one was there, probably smelled it. He got very good noses. He would just bolt back to me. But also in that same place where that same instant where it ran past us, another time we were down there, because it's good, we didn't meet other dogs and things. He was scurrying around looking for a pheasant, I suppose. And he let out the most enormous ear-splitting scream, the kind of scream you'd have for somebody being stabbed with a great sword through the heart or something. And I thought, what on earth happened? Blew the whistle. Dog came back, not a mark on him, but I noticed on the bridge of his nose a long whisker about four inches long that wasn't his. It's chucked on the floor of the wood. Great, I should have kept it. Very close encounter with that same big mat. What about their body language? Was there anything about the body language and their caution sometimes? They hunt and point, but they'd stop and sniff. And an example of smelling was when we were walking by the railway beyond Wellington ahead of us and around us were wheat and the dog's noses both went up we only got about halfway along this path we never got any further that day and sniff sniff okay fur no no big deal just think there's some deer ahead and go on a little bit further and Rowan Sonny looks terrified bolts back I thought okay I get a message that was not deer that's a big cat just he had rights that he'd bolt I don't know what happened when he did that screaming, but clearly if he'd got a big cat's whisker on his nose, that big cat had been having a go at him and he'd managed to run away. He was fast. I mean, the big cats are fast too, but that was very, very close encounter. And then we had another, which um, I let the dogs out for a piddle at about 10 o'clock at night in the winter. And it's really weird. It was at the other side of the fence and it, it let, flung itself snarling and growling at our garden mm-hmm. fence. And you've never seen two dogs dash back in the house and up so quickly in your whole life. And we looked up the window and across the railway line in the field, this barn of straw on fire. And apparently some local kids thought it would be fun to play with matches and straw, which how that fire happened. And only draw the connection that the big cat had been sheltering there and had been scared by the fire and just bolted over here and gone behind my house and garden. Did you hear it at all? Sure, it leapt snarling and growling at the fence. It didn't get over and I mean the dogs and I were in no doubt as to what it was at all. Angela, I can imagine some people saying, how come this woman has had so many encounters when other dog walkers in the area and other residents in the area are unaware and not alert to these animals. What's your response to that? Well, simply that I've been up in woods and places twice a day for many, many, many years, going back to the 1980s. It sounds like it's lots of encounters, but I would say on average about two a year. So it's not that many. But also, if you own dogs that are hunters, like pointers, the German shorthair pointers, 
and you're interested in nature, you observe. Watch your animals. You will see what they are doing. Pointing dogs killy probably are easier to understand if you understand them than a dog that isn't a pointing dog. Yes. Do you think some people have had these kinds of experiences but are not alert to the prospect of a big cat like a black leopard and so well, are a bit dumbfounded? They, they haven't had the experience yet because they didn't know. But sure, I've met other dog walkers up at the Forestry Commission and they've said, oh, that's funny, my dog has barked at something and run away and I just thought the dog was being silly. People have said that over the years. But certainly gamekeepers and others and stalkers, they have, well, similar stories to me and more frightening gamekeepers out doing fox control looked up and, and they've been in the woods and seen big cats on the branches. And one actually found a black leopard in the feed store where he kept the feed for the pheasants. And I think he reversed out of there very quickly. Now, the leopards that you have encountered, Angela, would you say that they are in good condition and showing no signs of inbreeding and fit and healthy and confident? <laughs> I don't know about the inbreeding, but yeah, they've got beautiful, glossy, shiny coats. Um, I mean, if they were ill, they'd be dead. You wouldn't see them. How do you think they relate to humans and dog walkers and farmers and horse riders? Do you think that they've learnt to just avoid us because we could be trouble, we could be injury risks for them, and so they just work around us and see us off the property if they need to, but otherwise they keep their distance and watch and stick to deer and rabbits and pheasants? Who knows what they do? Quite a number of dogs and certainly domestic cats have gone missing. The one that, here, the one that leapt at the fence... That presumably is the same one who's camped out in that field with high grass for half the summer. I hear it at night making little grunting noises. Certainly our local policeman said that 14 domestic cats died when that was hanging around here. And the same remark from just a resident not a policeman came from another village and said how very odd that that was by a big wood. The domestic cats keep disappearing. So there you go. Yes, there's plenty of deer. Uh, there's lambs, lambs galore all over the place at the moment. Just so many pheasants and plenty of rabbits. Food is not a problem for these big cats. Certainly Orchard Portman female and the Butland Wood area big male. We must be looking at their great-grandchildren by now, I would say. But they stalk you, they watch you. They don't seem to be attacking people, they're interested in dogs. That's what we've had is certainly interest in dogs and whether they're just defending their territory or curious. Can you tell us about the one that you encountered recently? You entered a nature reserve. I just uh, drove up and parked at a small nature reserve marsh by the River Tone. Uh, it was nine o'clock in the morning I got out the car smelled a strange sort of urine smell, not funny. And I got the two dogs out, not any of the dogs I've mentioned before. And to my amazement came huh, 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 three sawing noises from about 75 yards. And I was really, really surprised. Anyway, I thought, well, it's gone to the right and we're going to the left, so we'll get on anyway. And the first style we got to, about a quarter of a mile away, there was the same smell and smelled that same smell a week later at the high trees on the opposite bank of the river. Yeah, so you felt you were getting a warning noise to say, I'm here, watch your distance. I think it was just sort of saying, good morning, I'm here. It didn't sound very bad to me. It wasn't growling. It just announced, I am here. <laughs> I just said, OK, we're here too, you know. We got that one sorted out and... Uh, I think it was busy watching 13 lambs prancing around in the field. OK. I don't think it was too interested in us. So uh, there we are. But, yeah, I mean, my other dogs, uh, Ben and Eva, this is back in the 80s, 90s, we were walking again at Orchard Portman, and they were courting like a spaniel behind the lake. And I thought, this is odd. They don't normally do this. They usually court a much wider. And they suddenly shot down through some trees down towards... The lake level, these were bold. They're children of my American dog. And they started leaping up and down, shrieking and baying at a tree. And I thought, well, this must mean they've got the leopard up the tree. Got a whistle and two dog leads. They're going to have to 
to get on with it on their own. I wasn't going to go near, and I just stood still by the lake. And then about a minute later, I heard these feet padding towards me quite quickly. So I'd got the lake behind me, thought I was going to get a leopard. And instead, much to my amazement, I got a puma. And the puma looked at me and sort of, we both looked very surprised. And then it shot off up Stein Ridge Hill. But the dogs were nowhere to be seen. And anyway, I picked them up a bit later. I decided we'd uh, end our walk then. And I was talking to one of the gang about that. And he said, there must have been two. He said, you got one and the other one went another way, which is thought. Now, the sceptic would say, if we had these cats around and plenty of dog walkers, we'd be getting treed cats more often, perhaps. What do you think about that? I don't think so. At only those that have treed one, the other dogs got really scared. Pavra and Rowan were no, they're, they're not wimps by any means, but, but they acknowledged that the big cats were a higher up the scale predator than them, whereas Ben and Eva maybe just thought it was going to be fun to send a puma up the tree. They knew about the leopard, but I don't think they knew about the puma. I don't know if other dogs have done that. I don't think any of my dogs, certainly not what I've got now, would tree a big cat. I don't think they'd go near it. You don't think it could happen accidentally sometimes? A cat would just decide to ascend a tree to get out of the way? Yeah, and a dog could bark at it, but I just don't know. It depends on how brave or stupid the dog is, <laughs> is all I can say. Just because they might not like domestic cats, to chase a domestic cat, I mean, the dog is a lot bigger, isn't it? You know, when the boot's on the other foot, they might have a little more scent. Yeah, fair enough. I know a girl on a pony who had a terrier, and she heard the sawing noise and her terrier, and the terrier had shot off in the wood after it. It came back okay, did it? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't worth eating, was it? It's only small. Or maybe the cat couldn't be bothered with a pesky little terrier. Yeah. Um, can we hear about the photo you took? Now, I know it's not really precise and clear, but from your description of the whole situation, I think it's a very plausible story because I think you know what you're looking at. But I can understand some people just being presented with a photo saying, oh, that's not very clear, um, you know, I'm not sure. But can you tell us about the time last year, wasn't it, when you took a photo and retreated? February last year. I've got the date on the photo. The dogs I've got now, Hector and Donya, we were walking down the, it's a bridle path. We don't go hugely far, it gets very marshy, and I wasn't particularly well at the time anyway. But anyway, we walked down there, it was quite sunny, and so we go down the path, we get down to wherever we go. We came back, and it was a nice sunny morning, maybe 10, 11 o'clock. To my surprise, I could see this shiny black shape lying on a bank, a bank I've been over in the sunshine and I'd only got a little pocket Lumix camera with me I've got a better camera but that's the one I have with me and I looked at it and I thought well that's really weird um, I'll take a picture of it because it could be one of the leopards and so I managed to get a bit of a view because we we're on a bridle path and there was a three-strand barbed wire fence between us and that enclosure well I wouldn't crawl through that so I just did the best I could with my little camera and I got one picture and the idea was to blow up the black bit on the screen and have a look and see what it really was. Anyway, I managed to get the one picture and then kaput, the battery went two in cameras. And so I blew the dog whistle at it, a gun dog whistle. It didn't get up. I thought, OK, we'll just go back to the car. And it was only a day or two later that I thought, oh, I might have a look at that picture. I was about to delete the picture. And then I turned it sideways because anyone who's seen it, it's a picture of the clearing and the black thing on the bank. It's only a very small part of the picture. Mm. And that was the best I could do at that distance. And so I turned it sideways and I thought, oh, my goodness, it was a leopard after all, because you could see on the left hand side of the body, you could see its head. And it's poured by its muzzle and the, the withers and the back and everything. And it was just fast asleep on the bank in the sunshine. It's heard dog whistles every day and all day, I should think. It's not going to bother about that. It's snoozing off its haunch of venison from the previous evening. And you retreated and your dogs didn't detect it? No, it was a very still morning and the car was actually very near it. 
it was probably only 100 meters if less but it was just having a snooze in the sun and I went back with a friend and we measured where it had been and it was about five foot from the beginning of its nose to the start of its tail five foot long it's a big boy the one who probably had a go at Rowan and left its whisker behind and the one that ran past me in the winter when I thought initially it was going to be a big dog and it got very close to me it's the same one we know him and he knows us We'll um, put that one on the website, if we may. I know you have showed it to people and got mixed reactions, but your story behind it is very interesting. So if, if we may, we'll put it on the website for this episode. Put it on the website. I did put it on a Facebook chat, and to my surprise, lots of people insisted it was a shadow, which it certainly wasn't. And then a, a man on that group who has retired from the least forensic photographic expert went through the picture with the proverbial fine tooth comb, confirmed that it was a big animal, but he couldn't say what, which is fair enough, confirmed that it was a body. Right, it's time for Word of the Week, and for this episode we have pareidolia, and the spelling is P-A-R-E-I-D-O-L-I-A. Pareidolia is all about our minds making patterns and images from shapes that we see in rock outcrops or the moon or clouds, and I think we all enjoy that feeling of the child within us, and I still look for heads and shapes now in rocks and boulders and in clouds. And these days you can see some super examples of this sort of thing on the internet. So pareidolia is about creating your own illusion from the scene you are viewing and maybe sometimes seeing an illusion but not realising it, including when looking at photographs. So I guess you know what's coming up. In terms of big cats, especially when our main suspect is a black one, we have to be careful that we don't fool ourselves when looking at shapes and shadows and blobs within photographs and thinking our mystery big cat is there and we snapped it with a camera. This is all another aspect of confirmation bias, which we have discussed as a previous word or term of the week. I want to emphasise that I'm not accusing Angela of pareidolia in her photograph in the Blackdown Hills. But of course other people have implied, as Angela mentioned, that this photograph is an example of pareidolia by suggesting the black thing in the picture is a shadow and not the body of a mammal at rest. So perhaps Angela's photograph and the different reactions to it serve a useful purpose as a discipline to us all to be as objective as possible. And at least in this episode we've heard a full explanation of Angela's reasoning behind the photograph and why she believes it is indeed a big black cat. So we all know this by now, but pareidolia is a reminder to all of us to be extra careful we don't invent an image of a big cat from shapes or shadows in photographs and when we're out in the wild. So there's our word of the week, pareidolia. That these ones that you encounter on the edge of the Black Downs, Angela, how far do you think they roam? I do not know because there is no right answer to that because there are lots of woods. You're not worried about gamekeepers or being on land that you're not supposed to be on. You can go from one wood to the next. There's valleys, there's hills, thick hedges, little coombs, there's gullies, all sorts of places they can go. So they can go from the forestry private estates with lots of pheasants on. I think they just mooch around from the time of the year where the food is. Do you think they avoid the shooting estates in winter or do they have seasonal patterns? No, they certainly don't. I've heard stories, I haven't been out beating for many, many years, but certainly stories of people picking up and a lady who was picking up saying very quietly to other pickers up, right, we're going back to the transport now. I've just heard the final warning call. And she was somebody who grew up in Africa. So I would say the shooting estates are the place to be because it's obvious when it's the shooting day, no matter how well the pickers up proclaim that they pick up every wounded bird, somebody who used to go beating with a good dog will find the ones that the pickers up as have mixed. The big cat 
they'll find the wounded ones. It's easy picking, so those cats are quite sophisticated. They know when all the shooting parties and pickers up have gone home and they can have a snoop round afterwards or the next morning. Yeah. That's the place to be. Yes, they'd avoid the disturbance, though, during the day, wouldn't they, the noise? Oh, yeah, but they have been seen by people, and guns have had big black leopards run past a load of guns. The guns are, oh, you know, what is that? As I say, I, I don't go beating anymore. Yeah. We ought to come on to the question that we ask everybody, and there's no right or wrong on this. It's absolutely how people feel, and that is... You obviously see press reports and Facebook comments that there are these animals in different parts of the country. Now, how do you feel about the fact that we seem to have a range of black leopards and pumas and maybe some lynx? What do you think about big cats in the wild in Britain? Well, all all I'll say is that some of the sightings have got to be a bit questionable. Others aren't, and big cats are definitely here, and... They do mind their own business, I will say that. And they are definitely breeding. And I do have suspicions that the gene pool is being kept reasonably healthy by uh, perhaps releases. That's my suspicion. It's still going on. Well, I suspect that it could be. Or it has been way more recently than 1976. Well, how is it in the, what was it, 1989, 1990 that, you know, the other guy who was a, a shooting man and I, by sheer fluke, happened to meet. And the previous day, we were very closely to black leopards that we'd never, ever encountered before. And he was up on that estate and I was up in the woods a lot. And those cats just came out of nowhere and set up their territories. They just weren't there. And then they just were very strange, is all I'll say. I wouldn't say they were scared of people. They'd stalk you and things. But how was it that two just arrived? Yeah, you don't think they had dispersed from a different area and arrived in yours. You think they may have been released. Clearly they dispersed from another area, but whether they were assisted or not, who knows? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Interesting. It's very strange. The pumas just seem to cruise through. The leopards seem to have more distinct territory slightly concerning in a way about the one by the river but of course that's one that has been seen in other parts by the river tone who knows but they're definitely more leopards than pumas yes i think that goes for the general sightings of black ones against brown ones doesn't it yeah and the puma i saw a great big one on actually the latinist normally had leopards in that area and just near buckland wood i was driving up the hills and it was an enormous big male sitting in a field and I stopped my car and pulled in. It was actually an awful XBT yellow van full of dogs. And thought I'd try and get a picture, which I did. But by the time I'd got out and got the camera, the puma had got up and stretched and just walked into the near eye bit of wood. A woman pulled up beside me and she'd seen it as well. And I said, that was an enormous puma. And it was massive. And she said, oh, no, that was a fox. And I cite that as a good example of people who are not used to wildlife thinking a 12, 14 stone puma is a 12 to 14 pound fox. Yeah. That one was seen by someone else. Okay. Clearly, it seems we have to coexist with these animals. Are there any things that you'd like to happen? Do you think it's about sort of information and education and... (laughs) Well... Don't annoy them, is my comment. <laughs> yeah, or don't let your dogs annoy them. Well, some people won't know when they're doing because, A, they don't believe it. They don't know what their dog is doing, and the dog is on a kamikaze mission. There's lots of stories about people's dogs chasing them, and then the cat just turns around, as cats can do, and gets a poor out. That's all it does to the dog. The dog's lucky. A dog could make a nice meal as a change from slightly wounded pheasants. People have just got to be careful. And that's why I just say to people that I meet walking dogs that we can now go online and listen to the sounds these animals make. So familiarise yourself with them and heed what the noise. And the, the worst thing is a growl. I've had quite a few sewing noises and grunts, sort of coughs and grunts. And somebody told me that there were lovely nightingales to hear up at Orchard Portman Wood. So I left the dogs behind. I thought I'll go up and hear the nightingales. And I walked across the bridge stream from the lake and there was the most enormous, clearly a big cat, but I didn't know at the time, 
growling going underneath and I just sort of sod the nightingales I'm not hanging around here mm-hmm. I went back and some blokes with loads of beer in bottles went over and completely ignored the noise and that must have been a leopard with a deer it had just killed I didn't know what it was at the time mm. and most of the noises are kind of saying that they're here or there and the sawing noise I'm not exactly sure what that means it's a kind of communication of some sort seems to vary I think maybe a bit more serious way of saying they're there and then one day it was most awful weather pouring rain driving wind and I could hear a noise like a woman wailing further down the hill in the wood and I thought well nobody in their right minds would be out we're clearly not in our right minds going out in this awful weather that cannot be a person and I telephoned Sacramento in California, some kind of cougar, mountain lion rescue or something. He reckoned it was released one and that it was an in-season female calling for a mate. But the most prevalent noise seems to be grunts, a sort of cough and a grunt. So uh, don't go and look at it. Just quietly, very steady way, just walk away. And you're not hurrying and the cat will understand, okay, you've understood what the cat is saying. You're not scared. You respect what it's saying. And you're just quietly going away to do what we do. Yes, stay confident. Well, I don't know about that. Just composed. Stay, yeah. Don't show any fear and don't run and just indicate that you understood by that way of doing things, that you understand it's there and it wants its space and just quietly leave. That's what we do. And that's what I do, and some of the dogs have just bolted. Mm. Could we finish on the time when you were in touch with this elderly couple who seemed to have one visiting their garden? Yeah, it's the same village as here. And this old lady said that she was sitting in the garden and this big black one walked right past her a couple of times. Just walked through. Do you think it was just okay about that because they were so calm, there would be no sort of activity and no threatening vibes? She's not in the best sort of alertness that she might have been when she was younger. So we all we believe her, but she just sat there and it, she was just sitting and it just walked through. It was a nice garden with a little orchard and so on. These cats don't think they're scared of people. People don't hurt them, but they keep out of the way, mostly. And there's not much to stress them in their lives, so they don't get bothersome and they don't misbehave and affect our lives uh, much. When you read what happens in California, Canada, India and so on, it's when the houses and people encroach on the territory of these animals, whereas, in fact, what's happening here is the other way around. We've been here first and these cats have been introduced. It's up to them whether they want to go and hang out in fields near a village and purloin the neighbourhood cats and if they get away with it then they wouldn't say they're laughing but they've probably eaten what they want to eat there and then moved on somewhere else they don't try to get in the way of people but they definitely stalk and we've only had the one incident of ultra Portman female who would have died years ago when she ran right through the middle of my German pointers Angela, could you just take us through the different kinds of people that you've encountered in Somerset who are aware? Some of them seem to be aware and some of them don't seem to be aware and some of them maybe don't admit that there are cats. People like gamekeepers, stalkers, vets, horse riders. Yeah, OK, we'll start with the police dog handlers. They've all long since retired. and um, Some of them were in aisle and some weren't, but... One of them told me that they used to watch that cub from the mating we saw playing with the mothers in the evenings because they used to exercise their dogs up there. And one day, I think there were about three or four police up there because they used to train their dogs up there and exercise them. And they said, could my dogs track back from a carcass of a deer to where it was killed? And I said, said, they'd just go and eat the deer. And that was a non-starter. And they showed me this deer and it was, I've never seen anything like it, roe deer, and it had been completely plucked, just a huge circle of plucked hair all around it. I really don't think that was poachers. Dogs don't do anything like that either. They'd have just killed it and eaten it. So some of them believed it. The more modern police who exercise now on private estates up there, they certainly believe and know about the big cats. And they say, if you think big, turn around and go back. So that's 
one quote I got. Vets, yeah, they know about them. And then one or two pictures of carcasses and things, and they've been quite surprised by them. Gamekeepers, the ones I know up there, oh, yeah, they know much, much more than I know about the big cats. So they keep their mouths shut. They want their jobs. Farmers and horse riders, it just varies, doesn't it, whether they've had an encounter or whether they were aware. Whether they've seen one and and they know what they've seen. Yeah, horse riders see things because they're higher up. They see big cats. They see some of the wild boar that are now up on the Black Downs. And some of them have said, oh, I've been riding my horse and seen a boar grazing off the path and so on. And horses don't necessarily like wild boar, so they can bolt from those and they can bolt from the big cats. Yeah, I've had some stories like that up on the Black Downs, not down here. Vets, vets drive around a lot. Yeah, one of my vets years ago, an Irish vet, he went off to the uh, Middle East to look after racehorses. And he'd been called to a Shetland pony that had been killed, actually. He looked at some of the pictures in Nigel Brawley's book and said it's exactly the same way of killing. It was a Shetland with pneumonia, so it was an easy, easy picking. Had that Shetland pony been consumed at all? Oh, yes, partly. And then a cousin, a distant cousin of mine who's a farmer, he lost two well-grown calves. I'm not very knowledgeable about how big and ages of calves, but anyway, two calves, and all they found was two heads, nothing else. There's about sheep up trees. And I actually met the guy many, many years ago who's, walking his German shepherds and saw the carcass of a sheep up in the wood. That takes a big cat to carry a sheep across that wood and then dig it up a tree. A very big, strong cat. Certainly people on shoots have. The people who the hunt, not, they say they don't, which I quite believe. And I said, not surprised to make so much racket, anything with any sense of long since gone. Yeah, yeah. And just any final thing you'd like to say that you don't think you've had a chance to say before we sign off? I think I've covered quite a lot of our encounters, but I just will point out that we don't go out and encounter big cats, you know, twice a week or something. It's maybe once or twice a year. It's not that frequent. And it may be that you have been near them on other occasions, but not sensed it. But you do, you are alert. You do know what to listen out for or to see. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. They'd see us more than we see them. And and what I might call an encounter might just be a smell or a scrape or something like that, or because it looks a bit odd of a deer, a bit munched up. Usually when you see one, which is very rarely, it shoots across in front of you when you're walking. You only see it for a few seconds. Three times when I've had much better sightings, the first female no camera with me the one that just stood there that was the best I'd ever seen her and then um oh the puma up in the friend's field leaping you you don't really see them that often and they just dematerialize I've seen one across from my bedroom here walking uh, from the railway up a field towards the eight several summers ago but again it was in dusk and I looked out the window I thought what on earth is that calf doing walking up there and then I thought calves black the calves are charolais they're cream and then the next field and then i realized what it was and of course it disappeared by then Mm. so most of our signs can be things like smells yeah you can smell where they've marked maybe once twice i mean a bonus would be three times a year and that's uh, with hundreds of walkings yes and extremely difficult to capture on film unless they're resting or sleeping well, the, yes, that's the, that's the one, really, that it was asleep. And now, even if that camera fortunately hadn't conked out, it's just as well it had, because it would have been pretty dangerous to go nearer. So I just say thank you for, you know, dying when it did in a way. <laughs> you just, it's not a good idea to approach these animals, that's all I'll say. It's an animal, you don't know what it's going to do. It could run away, it could come towards you. These are Big, big, powerful animals, and they are successful killers. That's all you can say about them. They know how to kill, and just because they haven't killed a human doesn't mean they won't, but you just wouldn't like to put it to the test. Sure, leave them unprovoked. People are welcome to shoot my photograph, but that's what it was, and that cat and I, we we know each other. He might have just looked and thought it was me again. 
I think he was just fast asleep and he, he heard dog whistles. He just was snoozing away and he couldn't be bothered about us because he knew we were on the path. He probably thought, well, that one's nearly back to the car. They'll be gone soon. Splendid. Well, I want to thank you, Angela, because I know you've got a lot of experience and a lot of tips and advice. And it's very nice to have captured all those and to discuss them on the podcast. I want to say I'm sorry we've had a few technical problems, that the audio isn't the best, but we'll edit it to do what we can to make it as clear as possible. So I hope the listeners can live with that. So, Angela, thanks ever so much for coming on the show and sharing all of those points with us. Well, not at all. It's been my pleasure. Right, on to our final part of the show, and courtesy of BBC Radio 4, we now have a short extract from the Rambling series. Ramblings is a long-running, half-hour programme on Radio 4 in which Claire Balding and sometimes other hosts do a walk, and each time they do that walk with different people to explore their local countryside. And in 2014, one of these programmes had a surprise and unscripted part when Claire Balding herself, walking ahead of the group, claimed she saw a large black cat. And the location was a wild and deeply wooded part of the Wye Valley in Herefordshire. And here's what happened. Gosh, in the, we've walked out onto the road and turned left. And sitting in the middle of the road ahead of us, honestly, I thought it was a panther. It was the most enormous black cat. I mean, really big, like a dog size. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah. Did you see it? I've seen it twice along this hedgerow in the last few years. Really? Is it a wild cat? Well, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> no one's actually got photographs of it. I saw it. I saw it really clearly, yeah. It was sitting in the road, and it's just gone off slowly to the left. I've seen, I've seen black but, cats here the size of our Rottweiler. Honestly. Yes. And our friends have seen a big black cat feeding on deer carcass. It's disappeared completely, hasn't it? It's gone off into the woods and disappeared and not anyone who saw it. There's always been stories of a big black cat around on the Dowd, ever since we moved here 20-odd years ago. And a number of our friends have seen it, or a cat, but it, I mean, whether it's the same one over 20 years, I really don't know. I should point out that I never knew that there were stories of a big black cat. So when I saw it, I didn't even say to you, look. I just thought, oh, look. But, you know, I was just trying to describe it. <laughs> I, so I promise you I'm not making it up. <laughs> it looked very big to me. No, no, I would believe you. Yeah, and it just sloped. It didn't scuttle. It just kind of very confident kind of walked across the road and disappeared into the woods. Ooh, I'm all excited now. <laughs> Adrenaline's flowing. <laughs> OK, and soon after that episode aired on Radio 4, I went with a couple of friends to meet Roger, the guy you heard there with Claire Balding. We've got a couple of trail cameras up in the private wood where the cat went when Claire saw it, and Roger put one up in his wooded garden, which is just down the hill from the location. And so far, several years on, all we've had are lots of fallow deer and roe deer, squirrels galore, and the occasional poacher. Luckily, they've missed the cameras. And we keep in touch with Roger and the other locals there. We've got to know the pub landlord and the cafe owners. And like most places, I guess, some local people are really interested and fascinated and know of a few others who are interested in big cat sightings, while others are deeply sceptical and assume they'd know if a black panther was patrolling and stalking the neighbourhood. For our overseas listeners who may not know, Claire Balding is one of the most respected and establishment figures on the BBC. She presents high-profile TV programmes on sport, horse racing, show jumping and the Crufts Dog Show. So maybe a witness report from Claire Balding is even more influential than a DNA result. We're now going to mention a different female star from the BBC, Kerry Mucklow. And she is from the hit comedy or mockumentary series This Country. This Country is all about the sad but funny lives of a brother and sister idling their time away with no money or prospects or transport in a Cotswold village. As many listeners will know, the series has a unique style and you either love it or loathe it. And I personally love it because it's in the Cotswold town very close to me. But Kerry and Curtin, the lead characters, have become modern folk heroes here in Britain. 
And on our website for episode 26, we've put a link to Kerry doing a short piece to camera admitting her guilty secret of interest in big cat encounters. It's a piece released by the BBC as part of the unused scenes from the series. And it's lovely to see the mystery of big cats getting a mention and Kerry claiming she saw one. I couldn't resist emailing Daisy May Cooper, the actor for Kerry, to let her know that coincidentally I've received big cat reports on the edge of the Cotswold village of North Leach where this country has been filmed. And I remember one of the reports I've had from there is from a former postman seeing a black panther on the edge of town on one of his early morning rounds. Believe it or not, there's a black cat cafe in North Leach. And after lockdown and hopefully things return to some sense of normality... We are booked to record some podcast guests there for a Cotswolds episode. We'll be joined for that one by experienced investigator Steve Archibald, who is the go-to person for Oxfordshire. So that one will include some Cotswold sightings and we'll learn about Steve's work following up reports over many years across Oxfordshire. Finally, we ought to mention Ireland. If anyone is listening from Ireland, north or south, we ought to cover some of your Big Cat reports in some future editions. So please get in touch with any suggestions for any parts of Ireland and we're also on the case for more from Wales. For our next episode, one of our guests will be describing their sighting and their filming on their mobile phone of a big black cat up a tree in April 2020. So a recent and a rare type of report. From the scaling of that one, the cat was around a metre long in the body. So we'll hear about that and a bit more next time. OK, thanks again to our guest, Angela, and thanks to the BBC for letting us hear Claire Balding again. And thank you, everyone, for listening. It seems we go out to 52 different countries now, so that's lovely to know, especially in under a year of the life of the podcast. And if anybody wants to get in touch, you're very welcome to email me anytime. The email address is rick at bigcatconversations.com, and you can see that on the website. Until next time, bye for now.